Now let's talk about some of the implications of elasticity of labor demand. This has to do with labor unions and the minimum wage. Labor unions are collective bargaining arrangements where workers come together and negotiate as a group rather than as individuals. Labor unions often do achieve higher wages for workers. However, their effectiveness is likely to depend upon the elasticity of labor demand in an industry. Remember, higher wages in an industry that has an elastic labor demand will simply result in a lot of layoffs, whereas higher wages in an industry that has a more inelastic demand may not result in many, if any, layoffs. So unions are going to be able to achieve the greatest wage gains when the labor market demand is more inelastic. For example, the automobile industry is an arena where labor unions have had quite a bit of success. Why? Because the automobile industry has a relatively inelastic labor demand, in part because labor costs are a small fraction of automobile production's total costs. It's a fairly automated industry. So the higher wages have not been met with large-scale layoffs, achieving not only wage gains, but employment uh, continuity for the workers. Unions are also more effective with higher skilled adults working in durable industries. Well, the durable industries fits in with the automobile example I just gave, but that would also apply to other good producing industries, manufacturing in general. As far as higher skilled adults, these are workers that are less easily substituted with equipment, with technology. So again, a more inelastic labor demand. The key is that unions have to be careful. If they negotiate a higher wage, that could be met with a lot of layoffs or very few. And that's going to depend on whether the company has a elastic or inelastic labor demand. Another thing to consider is the minimum wage. The minimum wage has many of the same analytical aspects as labor unions because you're getting a higher wage. It's just instead of through collective bargaining, it's through government policy. But the minimum wage is subject to the same uh, consequences of labor elasticity. If wages go up in an industry where labor demand is very elastic, then likely workers are going to lose their jobs and not really benefit much from the higher wage. However, if the minimum wage goes up in industries where uh, labor demand is inelastic, then the workers are more likely to keep their jobs and benefit from the minimum wage. This debate over elasticity of labor demand is a big part of the discussion over the merits of increasing the minimum wage. Here's an example. In the fast food industry, where you do see the minimum wage affecting a large pool of workers, you have a relatively elastic labor demand. So when wages increase because of a higher minimum wage, you do see a larger employment decline. You see unemployment. And that's one of the reasons higher minimum wages have become an issue for a lot of people. Most of the opponents of minimum wage increases will point to the food industry and in some cases the, real, uh, the retail industry to make their point that job losses come from higher minimum wages. But a minimum wage hike in some industries uh, may not have the same effect. If, for example, uh, the minimum wage were to go up in the auto industry, like I just described, where demand for labor is very inelastic, it would probably be met with minimal, if any, decreases in employment. So it really depends on the elasticity of labor demand. It is worth noting, however, that the minimum wage targets the lowest wage workers, whereas labor unions tend to target middle income workers. As a result, the minimum wage tends to target workers that are disproportionately teenagers and low skilled and as a result are more easily substituted with um, technology and capital. Therefore, it tends to target industries that do have a higher elasticity of labor demand. Okay, some of these 
Elasticity implications will come up later, but for now it's most important to understand that any thorough analysis of the consequences of labor unions and minimum wage must include a discussion of the elasticity and demand of that particular sector. Let's wrap up this section with non-wage determinants of labor demand. What we've done so far is really build the demand side of the labor market. And we've talked about, mostly, how wage changes affect labor demand. But there are non-wage determinants. In our model, you can think of this as shifting our labor demand curve, either to the right, meaning more labor demand, or to the left, meaning less labor demand. Now, I'm not going to go through the illustration in this video, because in our next chapter, we'll be putting together the supply and demand curves and doing those shifts to highlight how labor markets are dynamic. For here, just visualize the effects. If, for example, there is an increase in product demand, then that would move with the labor demand. If the demand for houses increases, the demand for labor that produces houses, construction workers, will increase. If the demand for Starbucks coffee decreases, then the, the demand for baristas will decrease. Productivity is another one, and this changes directly uh, with demand as well. If workers become more productive in the construction industry, maybe it's because of more equipment or better technology or just more motivated, disciplined workers, that's going to show up as an increase in demand for uh, construction workers. If, in contrast, you have a less productive worker uh, for the same reasons, then that would decrease the demand for those workers. Another factor is the number of employers. If there's more employers in a region, then there's going to be more demand for workers in that region. Remember, the employers are the consumers. They're the buyers of labor. And as a result, more employers means more demand for workers. You can see this reveal itself as businesses shift from one region to another, sometimes from city to city, state to state, or even across nations. If employers are packing up and leaving a particular region for whatever reason, then demand for labor in that region will diminish. Wherever the employers are going, the demand for labor would grow in that new area. Lastly, the price of other resources influence the demand for labor. In this sense, we need to think of complements to labor and substitutes to labor. We say gross complements or gross substitutes. Example, a truck driver is a unit of labor, but a truck is a complement to that unit of labor. So what happens if the price of the trucks go up? Well, that would decrease the demand for labor. If it's more expensive for businesses to get trucks, then they're not going to demand as many truck drivers. Notice how the price of the gross complement moves inversely with the, price, with the demand for the input. Price of trucks goes up, demand for truck drivers goes down. In contrast, gross substitutes are interchangeable with each other. For example, there are some things that nurses can do that doctors traditionally have done. So hospitals see nurses as interchangeable with doctors in these instances. As the price of doctors, the other input, has went up over time, it has caused hospitals to substitute towards nurses. And as a result, increase the demand for nurses. Notice the relationship. The price of doctors, the other input, goes up, and the demand for nurses goes up. They move directly. That finishes up Chapter 5. We've covered a lot in this particular section. We now have the demand side of the labor market, which we can partner with our supply side from the earlier chapters and build the market model which we will do in the next chapter 6.